Turn with me to Acts chapter 4, if you would, Acts chapter 4. I always love the opportunity to be able to preach and have the opportunity to come, and I thank Lighthouse Baptist Church for having me here this morning. My dear wife is with me. Uh, she just spent uh, almost two weeks with my two oldest daughters in, in France and, and in Spain, and so I haven't seen any of my children for a couple weeks. I have four daughters, and uh, you, you want to feel bad for me? I have four daughters, I have two female rabbits, a female cat, and a female dog. <laughs> I'm going to write a book and I'm going to entitle it Life in a Girl's Dormitory. <laughs> and uh, I, that's what God's given me though and I praise the Lord for it. I'm special at my house. I'm special. And I, I really like that very much. Um, as it is custom at our church, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the word. I don't know if you do that here. If you don't mind that, we'll do that. Acts chapter 4 about Barnabas and cover throughout the pages of scripture this man. And I call my message this morning, what I want to be when I grow up. Would you bow with me in prayer, please? <clears throat> Our Father, I thank you for your holy word this morning. And Father, I pray that you would work within our hearts. Lord, I pray specifically here this morning that you would make of us Barnabases. And Lord, give us John Marks. And Father, I pray that you would make of us men and women who are disciplers and men and women who care about those who need to grow in the things of Christ. Father, I pray for Brother Hines this morning at Faith Bible. Lord, I pray that you would anoint him now as he stands before our people. And Lord, that you would give him the words to say that be the conviction of the heart of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that your word here this morning would, would be uh, a dagger to our hearts. Lord, do that work which only your Holy Spirit can. And we'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and glory that's due your name. For we pray in the name of our blessed Lord and our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. I don't apologize for using much scripture in my messages. I was at a, a missionary conference one day. And the, past, and the missionary stood up and he said, he said, for sake of time today, I'm not going to read the passage of Scripture. I'm just going to give my thoughts. And I raised my hand and I said, and, and you got to understand this, Whitmers aren't very shy, okay? I raised my hand and I said, what did you say? He said, for sake of time, I'm not going to read pa the passage. I'm going to give my thoughts. And I said to him, I said, why don't you just read Scripture and save your thoughts? And, you know, and he didn't like that, but um, I believe very much that the Word of God is more important than what I have to say. As we look at Scripture, there's some primary, <clears throat> I hope I can get through this, brother, primary characters in Scripture. I think of Abraham, very primary uh, Scripture uh, character. Think of David, mentioned all over Scripture. Uh, Solomon, Samson, Samuel, uh, in the New Testament, Peter and David excuse me, Peter and Paul, and all these major characters of Scripture. Then we see what I'm going to call obscure figures, figures where there's something said, but we know very little about them, like Melchizedek. We know very little about Melchizedek. Or Jabez, though there was a recent book written all about the prayer of Jabez. There's only two verses in all of Scripture that talk about Jabez. And then why I have what I call cachet figures in Scripture. A cachet figure in Scripture is one that is mentioned a few times in many different passages. Like uh, we see uh, John Mark that way. We see uh, even Melchizedek in that light. But one that we see is Barnabas. And what I would like to do is walk through the life of Barnabas with a man that I'd say I would like to be when I grow up. There was a survey done by Barnes. They, they surveyed kids 8 years old to 10 years old and asked them what they'd like to be when they grew up. Most young people and most young boys, they wanted to have something to do with sports. They wanted to be a professional basketball player, baseball play, player, football player. And the second to that then was firemen, and third to that was policemen. That was what the boys wanted to do when they grew up. They asked the girls what they wanted to do when they, they grew up, and the girls said, I'd like to be an actress. In, in a movie or a show or a play or program or whatever. And the second to that was a dancer. The girls wanted to be dancers. And the third thing was teachers and the fourth thing was veterinarians. That's what the girls wanted to do when they grew up. You know, it's a sad thing that we have made our heroes out of public figures today. 
may tell you this, there is nobody in the, in the sport arena that I look up to as my hero. What I look up to and point my children to are the missionaries who are on the field faithfully serving God. And that's what they ought to want to be when they grow up, is faithful servants. And we're going to look at one faithful servant in the life of Barnabas here this morning and find out what it means to be a Barnabas and live as a Barnabas. I'll forewarn you, I'm going to take very uneven steps. My first three, my first three points of my message here this morning will probably only take 15 minutes. And so when you see me say point four, don't think I'm about done because I'm not even close. All right? I'm going to take some uneven steps. So my first point in this passage is this. Barnabas, a faithful beginner, when the church was first founded, here's Barnabas. You know, from my understanding, this church is about six and a half years old. Is that right? Or thereabouts? Okay. It's, it's under 10 years old. I'm in a church that's 25 years old. And we still have many of uh, our core first-time founding members within our congregation. Uh, matter of fact, I took a picture here at our 20th anniversary of all the people who were still in our church that were founding members of Faith Bible Church. As I look back on those people, I look at the people who were faithful. When we, when we founded our church, we came into a building, and the, one of the buildings that we have is a 25,000 square foot uh, building. It's, it's a large building. It's our educational building, upstairs and downstairs. When they first walked into that building, they walked in. It had leaked all over the place. There were drop ceilings uh, all over the building, and the thing stunk like a dead rat. And as they began that building, they shook their head and scratched their heads and said, how is God ever going to do anything with us or anything with this old building? And, but you know what we do now? We sit and look at our, at our building. And it is, it, it is a nice building. It's attached to our auditorium, and it does us a wonderful job. And I sit there and think, praise God, for people who started and founded. And here is one named Barnabas, who's the faithful beginner in my first point. Either he was either the first to give of his land, or he was the largest uh, giver, or there was some significance in his giving for the Holy Spirit of God doesn't put anything in, in Scripture that's unimportant. And here we find that he is mentioned in his giving, and Ananias Anais, and Sapphira is mentioned in their lack of giving. It's not that they didn't give, it's the fact that they gave and said, we gave all. When they didn't, they gave part. It's not the fact that they were told to give all, but they said they lied and said, we gave all. But here's Barnabas who does uh, give freely of that which he says. He's a faithful beginner. All right, turn with me to chapter 9 of the book of Acts. And I told you we're going to walk through this life of this one individual. You realize we're going to point to every passage of Scripture that this man has mentioned. He is A, or he's number one. Barnabas is a, a faithful beginner. <clears throat> Chapter 9, Barnabas is a friendly intercessor. Chapter 9, look with me in, in verse 27. 20, verse 27 says this, But Barnabas took him. Now pause. For what I did is I opened you in the middle of the passage. All right? Barnabas took him. The him here, who is it? Well, let's back up and look just a little bit. All right? Chapter uh, 9, and look in verse 23. And after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. Wow, who's him again? Well, I'm now only halfway back in the passage. Let's go all the way back in the passage, all right? Let's look now in verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as there had been scales, and he received sight and rose and was baptized. Now, who are we talking about? Saul. Verse 19. And when he, had, <clears throat> and he received meat, he was strengthened, and was Saul. then was Saul certain days with the disciples who were at Damascus. And then the Bible says, that straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. Now, here's what happens, and you understand the story, is that he is the one who persecuted the church over the amount of years. He's persecuting to the point where they are afraid that if they see the eyes of the apostle, which is going to be the apostle, but it's now Saul, that their life as a Christian was in jeopardy. And if their life in, as a Christian was in jeopardy, they looked at this man as the most evil of all people, the one named Saul. And they then found out that Saul had a conversion. And I've seen this happen before. I had a man in our church who, who dealt drugs. When he got saved, he was saved from the bottom of his heels to the top of his shoes, if you know what I mean. We're all saved that way, but it was evident in his life. 
And he was saved and he was changed completely. But you know what happened? Certain individuals knew about this man's life in the past. And there was always a question mark for a good period of time, a question mark about the sincerity of this man. In Saul's conversion, these Christians have this huge question mark, and they're saying, how in the world could this man who persecuted the church now be preaching Christ? And so they didn't readily accept this, this Paul who was now preaching Christ. And this is now comes upon the scene, Barnabas. And here's what he does in verse 27. But Barnabas took him, who? Saul. Took Saul, and here's what he did. He took him and brought him to the apostles. Now, let me ask you this. If there was somebody who's known for being a mass murderer, and you're having a prayer meeting among the apostles, and somebody brings in this mass murderer and says, Hey guys, uh, you know the guy who's killing all the Jew, or killing all the Jew converters, or those that become Christians? The one who's killing everybody, come here, I want you to meet him. And this is exactly what happens. Barnabas takes Paul, takes him to the apostles, and here's what happens in verse 27. It says, And declared unto them, the apostles, how he, Paul, had seen the Lord in the way, or in that path, and he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming in and going out of Jerusalem. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed among the Christians. But they went about to slay him. Which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea, and sent him forth to Tarshish. And they had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified. Now pause, look at me for a minute. Here's what happens. He takes this mass murder of Christians in, introduces them to the apostles, and he says, listen, here's a guy who has been saved. He has been converted. He's preaching the word. People are listening, and they're getting saved by the drove. And the apostles say, I don't know that we can accept him. And, and here's Barnabas, who's a sincere believer in Christ. I believe he was a friendly beginner. And now here I think him to be a friendly intercessor. He came and says, listen, guys, this is a man who is faithful. You just got to give him a chance. Give him a chance. You know, aren't you thank, don't you thank God for a God of second chances? Don't you thank God for someone who, who will come along to you and, and help you and encourage you spiritually? In the valley in which we live, there are about 100,000 people. Because of some travesties that have taken place in the past in lives of preachers, there are people every Sunday morning that are in bed who used to be faithful to every service Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, and used to be deacons and trustees and have major places in the church. They used to go out and soul winning, and they're at home today in their beds because of what somebody did to them, some preacher had done to them in the past. It is a crying shame. And I want to tell you this, it is a neat thing when you got somebody like Barnabas who will come up and say, hey, you know what, I know you've been hurt in your past, but here's what God wants you to do. Have you ever had that kind of person who could just encourage you and do it in a biblical way that maybe he's even admonishing you, but when they do it, you know that it's done in love? I believe in my life, our mom was that way. She was to me. She could always put a smile on my face. My mom is one. It, I mean, she pitches pennies. You've never seen somebody so cheap in all your life and somebody so clean. You know, you've heard it said that you can eat off of somebody's floor. You can eat off my mom's garage floor. I'll tell you that right now. But my mom had a way about her of just saving pennies and doing things as we grew up. Ladies, do you know what it's like when there's six pieces of pie and there's seven people? How mama never liked the pie in the first place. You ever notice how mama eating chicken when everybody else is eating the wings and the thigh, and or everybody else is eating the, the good pieces, the, the white meat and the drumsticks, and mama's eating the wings? My mama was that kind of lady. And I remember one day my mama went out <coughs> and she found a sale at a secondhand store or a reject store that we called Gabriel's. And she brought me home. She brought me home four pairs of pants. And I was a little kid at the time. She brought me home these pants. And they had, and I pulled them up, and they had elastic in their waist. Boys don't wear elastic around their pants. And I remember saying to my mom, oh, I'm not going to wear elastic pants to school. Everybody make fun of me. You know what my mom did? <coughs> my mom sat down, and she said, I, you, I just want you to try them one time. I said, okay, mom. And my mom developed a little song. And my mom came out to me and said, you know what, son, those look good on you. 
And she said, put a smile on your face, put elastic around your waist, let your personality shine through. It'll brighten up your day, it'll drive your cares away. She made up this little song. And you know what I did as a seven or eight, nine year old boy? I went to school, my elastic pants singing, put a smile on your face, put elastic around your waist. Because my mom had so convinced me that these were the greatest things and encouraged me that I was showing everybody. And the boys in third and fourth grade were jealous of my elastic pants. Because it was the hard attitude, it was the difference in the way we looked at it. And here is a Barnabas who takes this one who is a mass murderer, brings him before the apostles and says, give this man a chance. And Barnabas was not only a faithful beginner, he was a friendly intercessor. Number 3, chapter 11 of the book of Acts. Let's hear those wonderful pages of Scripture turn. Acts chapter 11, Barnabas number 3, a fantastic testimony. He was a faithful beginner, he was a friendly intercessor, and thirdly, he, was a, he had a fantastic testimony. Acts 11 and verse 19 now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and Antioch preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Christians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was upon him, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Now pause for just a minute. Here is a church that God is blessing and people are getting saved. And here's the story, how they are faithfully serving the Lord, people are being converted, coming to the Lord, and growing in the things of Christ. And look in verse 22 then, because that problem arises. Aren't you glad you don't have any problems with your church? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you are, brother. There are problems. Wherever there are people, there are problems. I guarantee it. Verse 22, Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church was, which was in Jerusalem. And they sent forth Barnabas, now watch, that he should go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them, that is, challenged them. It's the word nutheteo. He challenged them or exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. Now pause for just a minute. Here he is going to these people and they already have the blessings on the Lord and he brings a challenge of, of encouragement to keep on keeping on. And verse 24 says this about him. For he was a good man. You ever have anybody that you'd like to say that about? You know, they're just a good man. They are a good man. Scripture here uses that. You know, sometimes when I'm talking to somebody about their teenager or somebody struggling with a child who's gone wayward, they'll make a comment like this. They'll say, well, you know, he really is a good boy. And I'll say to them, you realize the Bible says there is none good, no, not one. But Scripture here calls this man a good man in that it's the same word used under righteousness. He was a man who loved God. So in verse 24, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. He was a good man, full of the Holy Ghost, full of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. God richly used him. Then the Bible says this in verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarshish for to seek Saul. You know what? The guy who he got involved with, now he's wanting to go see him again. And verse 26, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much or many people. And the disciples were called Christians first there at Antioch. And you know why they were called Christians? Because they looked like Christ. They were little Christs. They were called Christians. And here is a man who has developed a fantastic testimony. All right. That's Numbers 1 through 3. Now I told you, here's the uneven step. Turn with me here to Acts chapter 13. I've given you three points. Barnabas, a faithful beginner. Number two, Barnabas, a friendly intercessor. Number three, Barnabas, a fantastic testimony. Now number four, Barnabas, a fabulous discipler. Now here's one more character comes on the scene. His name is John Mark. John Mark is the one who actually wrote the book God used to, use to write the book of Mark. 
I believe him was, he was the one who was probably a half generation behind all the other apostles. He was a younger man. And I believe in the book of John that he's probably the one who, when the Bible says there's a young man who runs from the crowd naked, I believe that was probably John Mark. But John Mark, the writer of Scripture here, before he gets to that point, is a man who waffles. He is all over the place. He is, he is not faithful in his ministry to the Lord. And Barnabas becomes his discipler. And here's where I want to look here this morning. Acts 13, if you would look with me in verse 5. The Bible says this, And when they were at Samalias, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Now, you, you'll see this. In Scripture, they call John, he's called John, he's called John Mark, he's called Mark. He's talking about the same individual. They had John to their minister, which just means this. As they came and they were serving the Lord, they had one young man who was serving with them who was to meet the needs specifically of Paul and Barnabas. Which, by the way, there's a very biblical admonition for, for training up young men to serve God and serve under the auspices of another pastor. And here's exactly what they do. They use this young man named John Mark to their minister, to minister to them, to take care of just the very tangible physical things for them. And look in verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Paphos, they came to Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. Now, here was a man who is, was they brought along to just be their faithful minister and do things for them. And the Bible says here that when they came and made a loop and they came close to Jerusalem, that Johnny boy, John Mark, he went home. Now, let me tell you this, and you can read it elsewhere in Scripture. John Mark was from a wealthy family. We know that, that his mother was a Greek. We know that they had, they had um, a large home, a large house. So when they came around where they were close to Jerusalem, John Mark got antsy. He remembered at home. He remembered at things that he had at home that he didn't have with the Apostle Paul. He remembered the microwave ovens and the large screen TVs. He remembered the Game Boys and the things that he had at home that he didn't have and what he wasn't able to use. Obviously, he didn't have those things, but he had the comforts that he did not have as he traveled around with these guys. And what happened was this. His flesh got a hold of him, and he got to thinking of this. Do you realize at home, Mama has a boiler, and if I want to take a hot bath, Mama can boil under that boiler, and I can have a hot bath. If I've got to travel with Paul and, and Silas, or excuse me, Paul and Barnabas, all I'm going to get to do is probably take a cold dip in a, in a pool here and there. I don't have all the niceties of life. So the Bible says when they came to Pamphylia near Jerusalem, he abandoned them. He left. You ever see anybody who grows in the Lord to a certain point and they don't go any further? It's a crying shame. We have produced a lot of infant Christians around fundamentalism. And you know what happens? They grow to a certain point and they won't grow anymore and it's a sad thing to watch. I grew up with a little girl. Her last, uh, uh, The last time that I saw her was probably 10 years ago. She's now with the Lord. She had a disease. Her disease was this, and I, I do not know the name of the disease, but her disease was that her spinal cord, her backbone, would not grow. And they came to, to her mama one day, and she was in first grade, and they said to her, this young lady has a severe problem. She will never grow larger than a third grader ever in her entire life. And it was a sad thing to watch because as she grew into adulthood, she was no larger than a third grader, and it caused many, many problems for her physically. And it was a sad thing to watch. But you know, a sadder thing than that because that young lady was saved and went to be in heaven with Christ. A sadder thing than that is to watch people who sit in pews and become what I call pew potatoes, where they don't do anything in the service of the Lord. They go to a certain point, and then that's it. Do you know what? It's a cute thing to watch a seven-month-old baby suck a pacifier. It's a shame to watch a seven-year-old kid suck a pacifier, isn't it? And you know why? It's because you got to be well beyond that. And my challenge here is this. Maybe you're like a John Mark right now. You've grown to a certain stage, and you've got no further in life. It's exactly where this John Mark is. He is an infant Christian, and he is in love with the physical things of this world. He has the desire to serve God, but he has a greater desire to serve the flesh. You know, sometimes those things happen in our own life. Let's be honest about it. I live in a neighborhood where... Everybody in the entire circle, I live on Arbor Gate Drive, 
Everybody in that entire, entire circle drives a green tractor called John Deere. I have a 14 horsepower red mower called Murray. Now, if you have a Murray, my Murray cuts grass just fine. But you know what? I sit and sometimes I'm mowing my grass, I'm looking at the neighbor. I'm looking at the neighbor over here because they have a John Deere tractor. They got a big green one. It'll throw things everywhere. It's got a PTO in the back. And you know what I do? I begin to, to, to lust after their John Deere tractors. And you know what? Here's what happens. We see something that someone has and we wish that we could have or consume that sort of thing. It happens in preachers. Preachers see somebody of their same age and they have a little bit bigger church than they have. Or they have a little more faithful visitation than, than they have. Or they have better revivals than they have. Or they see more people saved than they see saved. And the Bible tells us this. They who compare themselves among themselves are what? Fools. They're not wise. And here's the point that we need to get to, is that we don't become so enamored by the things of the world that we cannot minister. And that's exactly what happened to John Mark. May I tell you something, gentlemen? The only reason God's given you a good job is that you can meet the financial needs that you need to meet in order to best glorify God. Does that make sense? Do you know he didn't give you a good job for, for the idea that you're going to make a lot of money and have a whole bunch of stuff in your, in your, in your house? And let me tell you this. I get bent out of shape sometimes when I, I watch people who they want to get their kid a good education. And, and I think an education is a great thing. And you got to go as far as you possibly can in education. But I ask them this. Why do you want them to get a good education? Well, I want them to get them a good education so they can get into a good college. Why do you want to get them a good college? so they can get a good degree. Why do you want to get them a, a good recognized degree? So they can get a good job. For what reason? So they can make a lot of money. That's a crying shame. That's a crying shame. What we should be saying is this. I want my child to get the best education possible. If God's calling them in the ministry, I'm willing for them to go. And I watch people who are called into the ministry and the difficulties of going to the mission field are not from the wife and they're not from the children, but they're from the grandparents. And that's a crying shame. I have four daughters. Not one of them is going to grow up to be a preacher. Not a single one of them. But if they're preacher's wives, I'm going to praise God. And if they live in a little shack on the side of the hill and a little church and the, and the man they marry is faithful in preaching to God, I'm going to stand up and cheer. Amen. And if they're called to a little mission in some deep, dark Africa, I'm going to stand up and praise God for it Amen. and say that's where they've been called. And if that means seeing my grandchildren only five or, or six times, so be it. But I have a heart for them to serve God more than I have a heart for them to make money. Because you know what? It's all going to burn. And you know what? I don't know what degree, at what temperature, a John Deere tractor will melt. But it's all going to burn. And I may start the fuel my, myself. But God says it's all going to burn away with fervent heat. And you know what? For me to get encompassed about something so silly and insignificant is fleshly, worldly, and I'm convicted to my hilt, to do my soul. And here's one John Mark who does not have the desire and the drive that these others do. And so he goes home to Mama. Is exactly what happens. And here's what happens. He becomes Mark A. Mark the deserter under Paul, a fabulous discipler. Now, look in chapter 15, walking through the book of Acts. We have now Mark, the divider. This is under Barnabas, a, fa a fabulous discipler. Mark, the deserter. And secondly, Mark, the divider. In Acts chapter 15, look in verse 35. Acts 15, 35. Paul also and Barnabas continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And some days... After, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the, the word of the Lord and see how they do. If there's ever an example of how to do missions, this is it right now. They go and plant these churches, and now they're going to go back and see how they're doing and check up on them. Look at verse 37. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul... In verse 38, thought not good to take with him them, 
him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them, Paul and Barnabas, that they, that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took John Mark, took Mark and sailed to Cyprus, and Paul chose another named Silas, and departed, being recommended by the brethren under the grace of God. Now, pause for just a minute. When you get a strong preacher of the Word of God, he generally will have very little patience with those who don't have the same drive and the same spiritual tenacity that he does. The Apostle Paul here has little, little patience with one called John Mark. And here's what happens. These two men disagree, and the Bible says the contention is so sharp that they go their ways. Aren't you glad that today in fundamentalism nobody ever disagrees with anybody else? Aren't you great? Aren't you aren't you aren't you just thrilled that nobody ever divides over some silly issues? It happens all the time, doesn't it? It wears me out. It wears me thin. And here's two men, two men of God, strong men of God, Barnabas, son of consolation, the apostle Paul. The greatest, other than Jesus Christ, soul winner of all time. They have a contention among them. And Paul says, he ain't going with us. I'm not taking that lazy boy. I'm not taking that lazy, worldly boy with me. And Barnabas says, come on, man, give him a second chance. Give him a second chance. Paul says, no way. Uh-uh. And now I would never stand up here and try to correct the Apostle Paul. You understand that. I'm not looking down upon him for the decision that he makes here. Who would I be to ever correct the Apostle Paul in what he does? But all I know is this. Barnabas sticks with John Mark, and Paul leaves him. And here's what we read through the rest of the passage of Scripture. Barnabas is not mentioned, and John Mark is not mentioned again in the book of Acts. And all we know is this, that they went out to minister together again, and we know that the Apostle Paul had no patience for the carnal man. Now here's what happens. Turn with me into 2 Timothy. We're going to read and looking at every passage of Scripture, what happens here. In 2 Timothy. If you do your church history and study the Word of God, you'll find that the second, second Timothy is the last book that the Apostle Paul ever penned. And in that, it is more than likely he was only a few months from his death at this point. And chapter 4 is the last chapter that he would ever write in all of Scripture. He is less than six months, half a year away from his death. Less than half a year away from his death. And here's what he says. He has left them long ago. And I want you to see what happens here. Acts, or excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and look in verse 11. Only Luke is with me. Which, by the way, he had a thorn in the flesh. You remember that? Apostle Paul had a thorn in the flesh. I don't know what it was. My best guess is that it's probably his eyesight. But in God's mercy and grace, the Bible says that only Luke is with me. Hey, folks, what did Luke do for a living? He was a physician. He was a doctor. You know, in God's grace and mercy, when he said, my grace is sufficient for thee, for thee he still gave him a doctor. Amen. You know what? That not that God's blessing? That's God's wonderful blessing upon him. That's not my message, though. Only Luke is with me. Take, what's the next word? Mark. And bring him with thee. Now, I want you to help me out again. For he is profitable to me for the ministry. Hey, you know what the Apostle Paul had influential-wise in the life of John Mark? Nothing. He did nothing. Do you know what one other man did named Barnabas? He stuck with him. He stuck with him to the point to now, through some time, the Apostle ends his life by saying, you know what, bring John Mark to me. He's now profitable to me. Because a man who is a discipler stayed with him. I won't have you turn there, but in Philemon, in verse 24, he calls Marcus, which is John Mark, my fellow laborer. And you know why? Because one who stayed with him and been his discipler. 
Now, I want to give you this illustration. I study this passage of Scripture out, and I begin to pray unto the Lord. Lord, make me a Barnabas, and give me a John Mark. And little would I know what would happen within my life. God, make me a Barnabas, and give me a John Mark. Two men came in, knocked on my door one day. I was headed, I don't know where I was headed. I was headed out of the state somewhere to speak or preach. I don't know where I was headed. But um, they called the church office and said, my dear secretary, trying to protect me, said, um, pastor's headed on a trip. He, he can't meet with you. This guy called another pastor. And another pastor called me and said, Pastor Whitmer, are you out of town yet? And I said, no. And, I, and he said, these two young men, or these two men want to talk to you because one of the men uh, led the other man to the Lord, and he just is looking for a good church. And I said, the secretary didn't even tell me. She was just trying to protect me. Tell those men I can meet with them in 15 minutes. Those men came into my office, and this man came in with a cane wobbling as he came in, and he said, I'd like you to meet this young man, Brandon. Now get the picture here, okay? Brandon is 20 years old. He is autistic, and he, um, he is a very slow young man. And he introduces me. Brandon is six foot four, and he weighs 450 pounds. Believe it or not, he's bigger than me. <laughs> and he comes in, and I say, it's, it's good to meet you, Brandon. And Brandon says, in, his, in the way he speaks, he says, it's good to meet you. I, 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 this guy told me how to be saved, and I, I, I just want to be finding a church. And I took him over and walked him, <coughs> walked him from our offices to over to the auditorium in another building. And I showed him how, where we came together to, to worship. And I said, Brandon, it would be our privilege to have you in our church and have you. And I explained to him what salvation meant, and he clearly understood it. And he clearly understood it. And he started coming to our church here uh, just a couple months ago. And as he came to church... A Sunday morning, he had get, he picked up a Wednesday night prayer bulletin. We put our prayer requests in there, and we're a pretty formal church. We have four seating sections. Brandon was sitting on the my left hand side on the front row, and I stood to take the offering. Said, "Gentlemen, come forward and take the offering," and I, and I gave a couple of prayer requests as we stood there, and Brandon said, "Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh uh, pastor." You forgot this prayer request in the bulletin. And I said, what is it, Brandon? And Brandon told me what it was out loud there in front of everybody in the auditorium. And I said, thank you, Brandon. And Brandon will speak up. And I'm trying to teach him, you know, hey, you know, Brandon, we don't just, you know, speak up in the middle of the service. He enjoys the preaching of the word. He has grown in the things of the Lord. And one day, Brandon came to me and he said, Pastor, what do I need to do spiritually next? And I said, Brandon, you need to be baptized. Now, let me just say this. Five foot seven and three quarters, six foot four and 450 pounds. I said, Brandon, you need to be baptized. He said, Pastor, if that's what would please the Lord, that's what I want to do. And I said, all right, let's do it. I had a leadership conference a couple days after that, and I sat with my leaders and I said, gentlemen, ladies were there too. I said, listen here. I said, we've got a young man who's going to be baptized. He's 450 pounds. I'm, I'm 175 or 80 pounds soaking wet. I, I said, I don't have the strength to baptize this young man. And I said, I need some help. Hands went up. And, he said, and I heard this, pastor, pastor. And a man that came now as part of my leadership. I'm going to go back and tell you this story. His son is 17 years old. He had been hit in our town and had an accident and he has brain trauma. And this 17 year old boy for three years had talked to Brandon about his soul. And he said that I, I prayed for Brandon, I witnessed to him. And one day in church Brandon said, you know what? I preached this passage of scripture. And I said, would anybody like to give a testimony? I did, I did it on Wednesday night of a Barnabas to them when they were at John Mark. And Brandon raises his hand and says, that young man right there talked to me about the things of God for three years. And he was the biggest nuisance you'd ever imagine. <laughs> but he said, you know what? 
I just couldn't get over that fact and over that fact and over that fact that I needed to be saved. And then when somebody else who came and watered the seed, that man who came into my office, Brandon got saved. Well, three weeks ago, here, well, no, 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 that's not true because it was in February. In February, when we came to be baptized, I gave, bap I gave Brandon a little handout sheet of being baptized. And we have gowns. We have small, medium, large, extra large, double extra large, and triple extra large. It looked like Brandon was poured into the extra, extra, extra large gown. And I said to him, you know, Brandon, you can, wear, you can come and wear shorts under it to be baptized and a t-shirt if you want. And, and then just bring a change of clothes. Well, I'm thinking that Brandon's going to wear his clothes, then change into these things. In the middle of February, we had eight inches of snow on the ground. Brandon came in flip-flops, a t-shirt, and shorts to church to be baptized. And I said to him, brother, it's good to see you. And we got up there, and, and, and that young man who was 17 years old, who had, uh, had hounded, so to speak, him, Brandon, about the Lord. They, we all climbed in. All four of us into the baptistry, the, myself, Brandon, the young man, and his dad. They got behind and I began to baptize. And I put him down. If you've never seen water shoot into a choir uh, area, I mean, it was whoosh over the side. Those guys yanked him back up. And, and people were praising God and saying hallelujah for this special needs young man whom I prayed, God, I want to be a Barnabas. Send me a John Mark. And you know what? Brandon is my John Mark. And buddy, in my church, you better never make fun of Brandon because you'll be hung. And Brandon is our project. He's our John Mark. And I want to be his Barnabas. And let me tell you something, I so much praise God for the Barnabases of this world who have the patience to lead a John Mark to the point of discipleship. Now my question is this, do you want to be a Barnabas? Are you willing to be a Barnabas? It's going to take time, it's going to take effort, it may be take your finances and your time. It may mean that you're going to have to bring somebody like Brandon in your, in your car. It may mean that you have to spend time out of the services. But all I want to be is a John Mark when I grow up. I mean a Barnabas who's mentoring a John Mark. I want to be a Barnabas. I want to be someone who sees someone who just loves the Lord. And the Lord has so worked to me on this. Last week I went to a CC's Pizza. Do you all know what that is? And I watched a CC's Pizza. This girl and this guy came in. They had earrings and piercings like I had never seen in my life. They had them out the eyeballs. They, they had them out the ears. They had them out the noses. This guy had one that was an inch and a half big that, that you could pass a ping pong ball through his earlobes. And I watched these people come into CC's. And my church people turn because, whoa, that's not the kind of people who come to church. And you know what I did? I went over and started talking to him. And just talking to him, I said, dude, that had to hurt. <laughs> and I said, can you get a nickel through that thing? His ear right there? He said, buddy, I can get a ping pong ball through there. And I said, what do you do for a living? He said, I have a tattoo shop down here on 2nd Street. And I said, could I come someday and you show me what you do and I take you to lunch? And he said, sure. Three days from now, I have a lunch date with this guy who owns a tattoo parlor who looks like a pierced porcupine. But you know what? I'm going to share with him the grace of God and the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And you know what? When you pull up to the gas pump and some kids got a car and it's going boom, ba -ba -doom, ba -da boom, ba -da boom, don't think what a ridiculous thing. Think, that kid needs Christ. When you see a group of teenagers that are congregating at the mall, don't snub your nose. Think, they need Christ. Do you want to be a Barnabas? 
Do you want to say, I want to be a Barnabas so badly. God, send me a John Mark. Let's bow our heads in prayer. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, my brother asked me to go ahead and do the invitation for his voice sake. What I'd like to do here this morning is just challenge you to be a Barnabas crying out to God for a John Mark. More so to that fact, maybe you have a John Mark already that you need to be a Barnabas to. But we're going to give the invitation. And I'm going to just ask you to come up here and we're going to have a word of prayer if you sincerely want to be a Barnabas and give your time and your effort and your comfort to someone else who is a John Mark. Dear God, I so badly want to be a Barnabas. Would you give me a John Mark?